The Kingston Chronicles, written by Stevie George, narrated by Paul McCowan. The Midnight Man, Chapter One. Frosty wind clawed at my skin as I ran, bare feet striking the ground with tremendous thuds. I had been running for what seemed to be an unfathomable stretch of time as the minutes and hours blended together in my mind. Only by observing the sun could I discern what time it was. Throwing my head up, I saw that the sun hung deep in the west amid a purpling dusk sky, peppered with white flecks of light stabbing down at the surrounding countryside. I could not recall the purpose for my movement. Frantic as it was, I was forced to concentrate on my breathing, which had now become heavy with fatigue. Much like after being startled awake from a deep sleep, I needed more time for my mind to truly appreciate this waking world in which I'd sprinted through. While I had no recollection to call upon, there was one sensation that I'd slowly become cognizant about. Deep in the centre of my chest I could feel a profound emptiness, an intense void which ached my soul and provided me a driving motivation that forced me to keep moving. My strides, however, now become desperate and irregular. While the hollowness burned in my chest, my limbs felt a yet more fierce burning with each step I took. The flat green fields that I'd traversed over soon turned into wilderness as I was confronted with a dense thicket. The surrounding branches ripped shallow valleys of red into my exposed limbs as I dashed over the shrubs and low-hanging fauna. A muscle-twisting sensation accompanied my legs as the ground took a steep incline upwards. My arms swung with greater intent, the momentum aided my legs in the task of scaling up the hill in front of me. A few moments later, the thicket broke into a clearing as I reached the hill's crest. My body ground to a halt. I gasped the frosty air, desperate to fill my lungs. The emptiness flickered in my chest, urging me to continue my path, but the caustic stinging in my legs and the laboured breathing that scattered from my thin lips signified that rest was a necessity. I leaned on a nearby birch tree, its waxy texture rough on my back as I crouched down. I allowed time to pass, for my body to recover. The wind continued to blow, its temperature slightly colder upon this hill. The trees behind me whispered as a gale moved in between the branches. The dusk sky before me shone as the sun began to fall behind the distant hill tops, leaving behind a thick red ribbon that lassoed itself across the western sky. As my eyes trailed across this canopy of reds and purples, I felt a bitter sweet sting in my heart. I marvelled at the way the sun painted the sky with a multitude of fantastic colours, but the sight also filled me with a great sadness that I could not yet understand. Underneath this majestic light, lay a land that also matched the sky in both beauty and melancholy. A great river stubbornly rolled its sunset-tinted water east towards the sea. It fashioned fantastic waves that crashed upon the shores, creating such a noise that a blind man would have mistook it as the sea. So wide was this river that no bridge had ever been built over its great watery expanse. Upon its roaring banks sprang forth a green and pleasant land that stretched a great distance in every direction. Much of this land had become grazing fields for cattle and sheep with stout stone partitions that threaded their way across the flat plains and rolling hilltops. The fields, however, retained some of their wildness, with islands of thickets and woodland areas that now cast long black shadows across the greenness that surrounded them. In between these two imposing natural wonders towered a mighty city, whose black frame splashed across the land. But unlike the surrounding natural beauty, this city had no colours to speak of. Kingston, I spat, verbalising the word my tongue felt thick, coated in a greasy saliva. I knew of this place. Its dark structures stood like minuscule mountains, while its streets flowed with lights that formed shallow streams of brightness. From my resting place on the hilltop, I saw how Kingston's harbour sliced into the river with narrow black fingers, desperately holding on to great ships which bounced upon the waves. I witnessed how spindly tracks of some kind, akin to the legs of a great spider, crookedly manoeuvred their way through the fields, pulling with them smoking bulls of steam. Through unprecedented development, Kingston had further pushed itself into the surrounding natural area with its enterprising tendrils. From this backdrop, I could recall small fragments of information about this man-made hive of brick and stone. The city of Kingston had always been a place focused on seafaring and modest trade amongst its neighbours. This commercial activity, however, has now clearly exploded as mighty ships and metallic carts pass through its borders. For all these developments which bolstered Kingston's grasp on the surrounding area, there seemed to be one thing that stood out to me. 
As my eyes wandered across Kingston's buildings, I saw that a bright light sprang from the centre of the city, fighting off the coming darkness. However, many different areas of the city still remained untouched by light. A slight pang of fear sprang in my heart, bringing questions to the forefront of my mind. How did the people of this city create such a light? Had they spread this light across such a wide area in an attempt to fight off the coming of midnight? Midnight, I whispered, chewing on the word. It left a bitter taste in my mouth, a feeling of resentment. I had a reason to be here, a purpose as to why I had run an unknowable distance and now stood gazing at this city. As my thoughts reverted inwards, the emptiness in my chest painfully throbbed like a second heart in my breast. I wished to remain for a time longer, but I could not resist the longing pull that now grasped at my senses. My legs found life again, and I began to run. Downhill my sprint briefly turned into a slide before I hit horizontal ground. Forward I motioned, pushing towards Kingston. As the city drew closer, the wilderness of the countryside became increasingly infrequent. The empty feeling inside of me became stronger with each passing step towards Kingston. A good sign, but for why I could not remember. I needed more. I needed to understand my purpose, the reason for the emptiness in my chest. I recalled much whilst upon the hill. Height was always good for clarity. Should I find a vantage point somewhere within the city, I might be able to glean more into my purpose. I consulted my fragmented memory. I knew of a great church that stood near the centre of Kingston, a tall, towering block of stained windows and stone. I concluded that such elevation above the city's lights may inspire my mind into reminiscence. A chance that maybe the light which the people of Kingston shine upon the ground will also illuminate my path. A shallow fatigue made itself known in my lungs when I finally reached the top of the church tower. The gaps within the architecture's stone slabs and the statues that adorned its sides provided my narrow fingers enough purchase for me to clamber up with little discomfort. So tall was this church tower, however, that even someone such as I began to struggle as I neared the structure's summit. The sun had completely vanished by the time I clawed my way to the top. The sky a deep black, with a desperate few stars dancing in it. The church lay close to the town centre, in one of the areas which Kingston had grown numerous pillars of light. Their brightness washed everything it touched in a dusty yellow colour. Though surrounded by these shining new developments, this powerful structure that had been built with heavy stone and artistic stained glass stubbornly held on to its age. I remember when I first saw this building before the streetlights. It became the first structure in all of Kingston to shine every night, lit by thousands of candles within its grounds, all shadows cast out by uncountable tiny flames. But now it seemed that the candles had been replaced by whatever mechanism lit the streets. The church still stands proudly among the dust, as it had done before. But as I ascended its walls and peered through its windows, very few candles were lit much like many of the buildings I'd passed on my way here. Surveying the cityscape, I could see that many of the city's structures shone a greying yellow from their windows. These internal lights mixed with those on the street to create a blanket of dull light. While these new lights had scared away the darkness with the greatest of ease and convenience, they failed to shine as brilliantly as those many candles that had been in the church long ago. The bells of the church began to sing. The sound reverberating through the cold stone under my feet. I listened to each toll, counting aloud to myself quietly. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I fell silent, but the bell rang once more. Eight? I asked the church suddenly caught off guard by the unexpected ringing of an aged bell. Quickly I became concerned that it may have answered with a ninth, but the bells fell silent, quietly confirming the eighth toll. I raised a cold hand to my brow and massaged it gently, its sharp coolness contrasting the heat which radiated from my skull. As I travelled and the hours passed, I had time to gather my thoughts, to remember and to comprehend the circumstances in which I'd found myself. I understood that I had lost time, Never in the past had it taken such an amount of time to traverse from the countryside to the city, but as I entered its streets, I found that Kingston had become a hostile place for me. A long time ago the night had brought a dark peace to man, 
a circadian pattern that he followed both day and night, which allowed me to take flight upon this land with no hesitation. This night, however, too much time had been spent climbing upon rooftops or scuttling down ten-foots and alleyways as I sought to avoid lingering in the light. It was not the light I had an aversion to, however. Myself and others like me coveted it, almost worshipped it when we saw it shine as the moon or sun in the sky above us. For a time many years ago, we even studied their movements in the heavens above and lived our lives in harmony with those great disks of light. No, I avoided the light as I dared not be seen by the people of Kingston. I know that should any man lay eyes upon me and hold my image within his mind, it would spell a terrible fate for one of us. To fall under the gaze of man is to be understood. What a man sees, he considers, and then places into simple frames of understanding. Such frames could be fashioned from concepts regarding safety and danger, usefulness and impracticality, the common and the spectacular. He then further expands upon his ideas, creating more categories to separate what he sees into multiple representations, while using increasingly complex frames in which objects and ideas can be contained within. Through his thoughts, man can witness a single thing, but understand it in a thousand different ways. It is for this reason I must avoid the sight of man. To be understood in such a manner and forced into the multiple cognitive cages would slowly turn my soul apart and drive me to an unescapable madness. Not all men think with the same quickness and some men avoid thoughts altogether, but once a man starts thinking, when he truly starts thinking, he cannot stop. Once man begins to grasp us within his mind, we begin to feel his mental probing almost instantly. It often starts slowly with a feeling of hollowness and emptiness in one's chest, but gradually swells and expands into a crazed void from which no sanity may ever return. If myself or others like me were to fall under the gaze of man, the only way to prevent our slow decline into insanity, as our souls are torn apart within a man's mind, is to slaughter the one who saw us. I had no memory of being seen by any man, but I now understand that it must be for this reason I had begun my flight so many hours ago. I stood at the edge of the church tower and peered west. The wind had calmed slightly, its forceful gale now gently licking my skin. I hoped that surveying the city from such a height might inspire a sense of direction within me, and to where the one who saw me resided. While regarding the city from my vantage point, over the lights in which the city dimly shined, darkness found its home within the more residential areas. As I regarded this canopy of black rooftops, the feeling of emptiness intensified in my chest and a sudden powerful sense of urgency took hold of my limbs. I could feel my body try to take flight towards this darkened area of Kingston. Unlike last time upon the hill, however, I had the cognition to resist the animalistic urges to break into full flight. I concentrated, focusing on the feeling, using it as a guiding light. On the edge of brightness, where the streetlight fades and the darkness dwells, on the far side of Kingston's centre, that is where the pulling demands I go. I placed both of my hands firmly on the dry stone parapets of the church. I wished to stay here, to watch the sunrise, but my body continued to rebel against my non-action, and I was compelled to move once again. As I slipped away from the brightness of the city centre, I found myself once again submerged in refreshing darkness. The wind had picked up once more, and now howled its way towards the empty streets, noisily beating against my ears as I went. I carefully twisted and scampered through the streets, using the pans of hollowness in my chest as a compass to guide me towards my destination. Closely knit dwellings, each armed with identical tall square windows, flanked me while forming a wall that protected the surrounding area from the light that shined in Kingston's centre. Like the sun rising on a distant horizon, the city's light made an attempt to break over the rooftops of each house, but it lacked strength and only residues of light spilled into the street, casting a grey twilight over all it touched. I stalked past the dwellings, skulking on hands and feet should I need to suddenly hide from the sight of any who may be out at this late hour. My eyes flickered at windows and down ten foots, hunting for the right place. The destination was here. One of these houses, I could feel that the soul I was looking for was close. 
I had been gazing upon a house directly opposite to where I had crouched when my thoughts became interrupted by a short, intense pain in my chest. So sudden was this pang of emptiness that my hands clasped at my chest as I let out a quick gasp. I wheezed. The pain diminished as I spoke, but my hands defensively remained at my chest. I allowed time to pass for a short while as my eyes spread across the building. A door to its left, a stout rectangular window to the right, and a second directly above. No lights shone from within the building, at least not from the two windows within eyesight. Enter? I asked myself. My destination was this house for certain. My flash of emptiness confirmed that. I simply had to enter this home and quietly end the man who had seen me. I had to complete my task with utmost secrecy, as should I awaken anyone in the street with the chaotic noise that killing usually inspires, I would risk being seen by a multitude of others. To have your soul comprehended by one person is a slow and maddening process. To have your soul comprehended by a multitude, however, to have a group discuss, share their ideas, refine the frames of reference in which you are understood together, that would be instant, mind-altering torture. Silent. I confirmed. I motioned towards the entrance of the building, a slim and dark door with an iron handle. I tested the handle with a gentle twist. It spat out a quiet metallic sound as it refused to turn even a small distance. I let out a deep sigh as I wrapped my fist around the door handle, covering it with thin fingers. Breathing deeply, I slowly began to twist, but the lock stubbornly held against me. I strained my arm, the veins on my wrist becoming visible under the pressure, but the handle remained stubborn, and so I brought a second hand to assist. Slowly I could feel the internal locking mechanism give way until a sudden bang dully sprang from the door and all pressure in my hands dissipated. The wind roared its approval as I opened the door. With cautious speed I crossed into the darkness of the house. As I entered, I could see the faint outline of a staircase in the dull lighting, and so flew towards it, bounding up groups of steps with long, silent strides. As I climbed to the last step, I saw two doors stationed on the landing before me, both closed and silently guarding the rooms that lay behind them. The door positioned towards the back of the house, however, captured my attention instantly, as between the door and the floor lay a gap in which a bright light skittered towards me. Excitement. This is where the soul I sought must be. The void in my chest once again manifested itself, more intense than any moment before. It suddenly racked across my whole body, bringing forth a burning sensation that I could not resist. I lost control as my limbs snaked their way towards the door, smashing it aside. The light from within the room wrapped around me with a great brightness, bringing havoc to my eyesight. The momentum from my sudden flight forced me to continue through the door where I was confronted by a silhouette, standing firm and unmoving in the centre of the room. With a tremendous fury my arms thrust towards the figure, my hands bludgeoning the silhouette with such force that my hands violently emerged from the other side of its torso with destructive ease. I was ready to experience a sudden feeling of relief, a warm fullness within my chest once again. But I felt no sensation, not within or without me. My hands expected the resistance of bone, my skin prepared to feel the wetness of blood, my arms readied themselves for the human's weight to collapse. None of these feelings came to pass. It was as though I had punctured a cloud. Now bathed in the same glow as the figure, my eyes became familiar with the level of light in the room. In my confusion, I began examining the frame that my hands had skewered. It was a statue of some kind, equipped with the features that reminded me of the female variety of mankind. This statue, however, was unlike those that I had seen decorate the church. While the statues that clung onto the church walls were crafted from stone, this figure was shaped out of thin wire, expertly wound together to create a hollow frame. Further separating this shape from its stone counterparts was that it was draped with a soft silk of the most vibrant colours. It was only now that I truly appreciated that instead of ripping apart the soul who saw me, my arms merely punctured through a mannequin, adorned in a dress the colour of sunshine with beautiful sky-blue ribbons daintily hanging from its fabric. I whispered quietly, unable to restrain my appreciation for something this magnificent to my eyes. I withdrew my arms and the hollow figure fell to the ground with a soft thud. 
as I regarded the dress-clad mannequin on the floor, now with two violent holes in its chest and stomach, I almost felt ashamed that I had caused such unnecessary damage to something so charming. I looked around the room for a moment, completely forgetting about the soul I came to find. Pressed against the wall further from me stood a low table peppered with materials, threads and a lantern that shone an almost unnaturally bright light. The soul I sought must be a tailor, I thought to myself, a dressmaker. The emptiness I had felt previously had now been replaced with a great curiosity. My eyes scattered across the dressmaker's table as I walked with childlike steps towards it. Spotting a white glove upon its surface, I felt compelled to pick it up and examine the dressmaker's unspoiled work. The whiteness of this little hand garment was pure like that of the stars that glitter across the night sky. <laughs> what a wonderful thing to have been made. I looked at my hands covered in filth from my clambering and skulking up buildings and across the streets outside. A long time ago my hands were soft and gentle, much like the gloves that I saw before me. Now they were monstrously deformed. The flesh from my fingertips had long ago atrophied away, leaving only sharp, jagged bone behind. The skin that was left on the palms and knuckles had become as tough as leather, much like the soles of my feet. How long have my hands taken such a form? I picked up a glove, dirt spilling from my fingers onto the star-white fabric. Gingerly I slipped my hand inside. Quickly the material expanded beyond what it had been designed to and I could feel a tight squeeze constricting my palm. I pushed my hand onwards, my splintered fingertips stabbing their way through the glove's material until the garment met the webbing in between my fingers. The glove must have been designed for a hand half the size of mine, as it barely wrapped around my hand and left my fingers exposed. I raised my hand across from my face and examined it with an almost adolescent curiosity. I clenched my hand into a tight fist before fanning out my fingers. Stars! I spoke aloud, a fraction louder than intended. Almost immediately after I spoke this word, as though I had summoned it myself, a throbbing sensation slowly expanded in my chest, an unpleasant reminder of the emptiness I felt, now steadily expanding into a slight pain. I raised my now gloved hand to my chest, the soft material warm but ineffectual as the pain intensified. I don't know who or what you are, but I'm not looking for any trouble, a voice rattled from behind me. My eyes widened and I twisted on my heels towards the sound. Clad in a blue jacket stained in patches of black, an aged man with bone-white hair stood in the doorway, a countenance spread across his face that expressed both caution and fear. How can you be here? The dressmaker said firmly, his wrinkled hand clenching a long pair of scissors like a knife. I could barely hear him over the beating of my heart. I could feel his eyes roll over me, and the sensation of being watched magnified the painful thumping in my chest. I felt that with every second I stood in his sight, his mind worked frantically to understand what I was. I could bear it no longer. With desperate movements I threw myself at the old man, flailing my shattered fingers towards his eyes. The old man, however, quickly brought up his scissor-armed hand to shelter his face from my assault. The momentum from a charge pressed the metal through my palm, forcing its sharp tip to protrude past skin and bone. Black bile streamed from my wound as I screamed, a high-pitched sound completely foreign to the soundscape of Kingston. I wailed with such an angry passion that the old man cowered covering his ears. The emptiness had now been replaced with a total animalistic rage that now filled my chest. Removing the scissors from my hand with a painful pull, I scolded the old man with a strong kick to his knee. I felt a bone shatter as the sole of my foot made contact, and an audible crack scattered across the room. Help! the old man cried as he crumpled to the floor with a juddering bang that exploded across the floorboards. I swooped down to him, firmly planting my wounded hand over his eyes, holding my free hand above the man's chest. I straightened my fingers and brought them together tightly. The old man struggled underneath my restraining hold as he meekly continued to call for help. Thrashing about on the ground, he desperately pulled at my wrist in an attempt to pry my bloodied hand off his eyes. The dressmaker's attempts at resisting my grasp were futile, as my rage had inspired a wicked strength within me that far surpassed his. Gently at first, I pressed the tips of my fingers into the space just below his ribcage. At first the old man did not respond and continued to squirm and resist as he had before, but as I slowly increased the pressure he began to panic. 
No, 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 please don't, he cried, as his hands moved from my restraining gasp to try and repel the advance of my free hand. My fingers began to break his skin. Tiny brooks of blood began to stream from underneath my fingernails. I pushed further. The old man gasped as his head snapped towards the doorway leading out of his room. Get out, he shouted towards the darkness. Leave! He repeated these cries as my fingers bluntly sliced into his diaphragm. I was knuckle-deep when I began to truly feel the warm wetness that I had been denied earlier when I struck at the dress-clad statue. The old man's grip intensified, his screams now replaced with a gargling of blood. I shoved my fingers further, my whole hand becoming submerged in the old man's body. I swam through organ and muscle until my hand was underneath the dressmaker's ribcage. Violently I started to squeeze whatever I could within the old man's chest and pull. My hands worked independently, pulling out pulps of flesh and organ, dripping with sinister amounts of blackened blood. With each fistful of flesh I withdrew from his chest, I could feel the emptiness in mine receding. As death hastened towards the dressmaker, fullness settled into me once more. A steaming pile of the dressmaker's insides had piled up beside me when I realised he had stopped resisting. His arms impotently laid by his sides, and any noises he had previously spluttered from his mouth had ceased. Releasing my grasp from the dead man's head, I could now appreciate the horrified visage he wore on his face as his life ended. His eyes were shut tight, throwing wrinkles across his face, while his mouth expressed a pained, blood-infused grimace. I let out a deep sigh as my arm slithered out of the dead man's chest, leaving behind a cavern that pooled into a thick poultice of red. The rage inspired by the emptiness within my chest had now receded and I once again felt whole. A cool calmness now settled over my consciousness, and I welcomed the feeling like a cold spring on a blisteringly hot day. I returned to a standing position when a jolt of discomfort flashed in the palm of my hand, painfully reminding me of the wound that the dressmaker managed to inflict upon me. When I scrutinised my injury, I realised that not only had the old man opened a wound in the palm of my hand, but also that the hand in question wore the white glove I had picked up from the table. The pure star-white material was now infected with a black hole of blood in its centre and a regretful tear in its fabric. It was a shame that such a beautiful thing had become ruined in the melee. I was deep in thought when a noise suddenly caught my attention. A gentle patter, the sound of soft feet upon cold floorboards. My gaze threw itself towards the doorframe, peering into the darkness of the corridor. It suddenly dawned on me that throughout the altercation myself and the old man had produced a great amount of noise between us. I had screamed when the old man stabbed me with his scissors while he cried for help as I ended his life. He also cried something else as I began ripping into his frame. In the chaos of killing, he shouted, Get out, and leave. At that time I had thought these commands were directed at me. Only now did I realise I was not the only other being in this household. I continued to look into the darkness. Slowly manoeuvring towards the staircase, I could see a small and slender figure, its eyes reflecting light back towards me. Unfortunate, I growled, feeling the emptiness once more returning to my chest. 